Um, I'm going to shift the spotlight from production to consumption, uh, away from organizations' internal processes to consumer processes, and the company consumer interface, uh, marketing, sales, customer services, and so on. Uh, in the process, I will ask some questions about what a lean economic system might look like as distinct from a lean organization in isolation. Uh, so, um, parallel to the, the 20th century revolution of mass production, there was another revolution focused in communication. The 20th century started with a printing press, and then we had radio, and then we had TV, and then we had satellite communications, uh, and they created today's global mass media. There are two things to note about this communication revolution. First, each new technological revolution reduced the cost of producing and distributing uh, information, so much so that nowadays we're awash with information. We have information overload. Second, each fancy new bit of technology that came along reinforced the same basic trend, which is of top-down flows of information from producers and distributors of information to uh, the consumer. So top-down uh, information flows are the foundation of push marketing uh, as epitomized by mass advertising. And batch, batch production needs push marketing because the more you seek economies of scale, the more you produce, and therefore the more you have to sell. Uh, you have to sell what you've made, and if you don't, you go bust. So there's a survival imperative there. You have to push. So these two things go together perfectly. Marriage made in heaven. So, uh, in fact, together they created an incredibly powerful win-win-win-win system. Under this system, uh, companies invest vast sums of money developing and making new products, which they then advertise to consumers via the mass media. This creates two new benefits. First, it alerts consumers to these new value opportunities, which is great. And second, the advertising then also goes on to subsidize the media, so you get subsidized or free uh, news and entertainment. So you get two wins out of it as a consumer, and you pay for it with your attention. The advertising then drives consumers into the store, looking for those valuable new products, which retailers are only too willing to make available. And so consumers then buying these products, then provide the funds for another twist of the circle, and actually off it goes. A spiral, a win-win-win spiral. Brilliant. So each of these elements of mass production, distribution, and communication come together to create a single, coherent, mutually supporting system. And uh, like bat batch production, push marketing exercises a powerful mental stranglehold on its practitioners. Once they see the world through this lens, they find it almost impossible to see an alternative. So, in fact, push marketing has the power of ideology. And this ideology revolves around the maximum, understand your customer. Focus on your customer. Get close to your customer. Identify and meet your customer needs. And uh, it's the power of ideology because once you're thinking like this, who could possibly disagree? What should we do instead? Not focus on the customer, not understand the customer, not meet their needs. But there's a fatal flaw at the heart of this entire system because it's based on top-down flows of information. That's sellers saying, here we are, this is what we've got to offer there are hardly any, any bottom-up flows of information from the buyer to the seller. Under push marketing, the customer becomes a stranger. And the stranger isn't in a position to say, here I am, this is what I want, in a mass organized way. So while there are huge amounts of information, a tidal wave of information coming down from the producers of information, uh, there is very little information about demand from the horse's mouth going up the system. As a result, the entire system works on guesswork. Without rich, real-time information about demand, suppliers have to guess what customers might want to buy, how much of it they might want to buy, which of them might want to buy it, 
where they might want to buy it from, uh, and so on. And this guesswork, of course, it's tempered, it's tempered by hugely expensive, sophisticated research. But ultimately, it's still guesswork. And the byproduct of guesswork is waste. Huge amounts of it. So, in modern consumer markets, 90% of new products fail. Quite a big wastage rate. Distribution fares a little better. Batch logic relies on pushing a scale, so the more you produce, the more you have to sell, so that in, t in, in turn creates just-in-case distribution strategies, where you try to distribute your product to as many places as possible, just in case someone walks into the store and wants to buy it. So today, the average out-of-town superstore carries around 40,000 stock-keeping uh, units, but the average consumer only buys 400 of these SKUs in the course of a year's shopping. So that means they do not buy 99% of what's been made, made available in that store. But retailers and manufacturers are still spending all that money sourcing those products, distributing them to the stores, putting them on the shelf, and so on. And then they're left with another extra layer of waste because they have all those products that they didn't sell. So then they have to uh, either have returns or clearance sales or markdowns or whatever it happens to be, promotions, to get rid of the stuff that they didn't sell. So that's another extra waste on top. So just-in-case distribution is matched by just-in-case advertising and communication, which is basically throw messages to anybody and everybody just in case they might be influenced to buy our product. So this is uh, uh, some uh, results from a major car manufacturer's analysis of one of its recent TV advertising campaigns. Uh, it's a pan-European campaign, reached everybody who uh, watched TV. They then uh, analysed who might be interested in the message we've just communicated. Well, 95% uh, of their audience was uh, aged over 17 and had a driving licence, so that's a pretty good start. Uh, but only a quarter of these ever buy a new car, uh, and only 50% of this 25% would ever consider buying this brand. Uh, what's more, only 11% of that 50% were actually in the market for a new car at that particular time, and only a quarter of this 11% were in any way interested in buying that particular type of car, and so on and so on. So the results of this analysis showed that 99.9% .9 of the money spent on that campaign, campaign was wasted. Uh, at best, the message was irrelevant, and at worst, damaging to its recipients. Those are not my words. Those are the car company marketers' own analysis of their own campaign. By the way, uh, direct marketing, which is supposed to be driven by data, uh, based on a deep analysis of customer needs, uh, fares little better. The typical response rate, rate nowadays for a direct mail campaign is about 1% to 2%, which means we're talking about 98 to 99% waste. And when direct marketers boast that their incredibly sophisticated data analysis had led, has led them to a 20% increase in response rates, what they're talking about is a jump in response rate from 1% to 1.2%. Uh, they never mention the other 98%. So if you put all this waste together, it adds up. In fact, over the course of the last uh, century, while we've got progressively more efficient at actually making things, we've got progressively less efficient at bringing them to market and selling them. If you divide economic activity into the broad buckets of making and matching connecting, and that is everything you have to do to close a transaction relating to the product that you've made, the costs of matching and connecting have exploded from a quarter of all economic activity 100 years ago to uh, over a half today. This means that in terms of the big picture of economic opportunities, the matching and connecting or customer interface side of things is now the biggest opportunity. Uh, or challenge, bigger than the operational making side of things. And by the way, these calculations take no account of the costs of going to market for the consumer, because currently no one measures that. So just one example, the more advertising messages that are thrown at us, the more time and effort we have to spend filtering through them to find out what's useful for us, or else the harder we have to work to block or, or, or edit out the stuff that's been irrelevant to us. So the waste isn't just happening on one side, 
It's happening on both sides. Now, the point is that new ways of getting past these roadblocks are beginning to emerge. Beginning, only beginning, but beginning to emerge. Looking to the future, they could help us design a new and very different, perhaps lean, economic system. So these new opportunities are emerging from a series of business and information services uh, uh, innovations which don't follow the rules of the old system and which introduce a new logic by working on the side of the individual, helping individuals to improve their processes. To see the potential significance of these personal information management services, we need to look at wealth creation through a different pair uh, of spectacles. So, uh, here's the traditional uh, view. Uh, system has two basic entities, producers, organised into companies, uh, which make value and sell it to consumers who buy this value and then consume it. So the bridge between these two entities is going to market, which is conducted by companies, marketing, sales, and so on, which is designed to change consumer attitudes and behaviours to make sure they buy our product and not that of my competitor. So uh, to do that, we uh, measure all our uh, success in terms of what it means to us, in terms of our seller's metrics, via with things such as sales, increases, market share, margin, and so on. Note, we're not measuring the customer's KPIs. We're measuring our KPIs. Success is defined by our KPIs. Of course, actually doing all these things, you know, actually making stuff, uh, bringing it to market, distributing it, communicating it, and so on and so on, developing metrics to tag it all, all very, very complicated stuff. But when push comes to shove, the model itself is pretty straightforward. Um, so what's this uh, alternative perspective? Well, under the alternative perspective, we don't see a consumer. I'm not a consumer. I think a consumer is an insult to a human being. Uh, human beings are active producers. They are, are in the business of producing the most important thing in the world, human lives. So we, we're, we're facing people who are creating the most important product in the world, human lives. And when we look at the business of producing human lives, of being a, a producer, we see that it is indeed a business in its own right. A business that does all the things that every other business does. So this business manages many, many different departments, such as my money, my home, my health, and so on. And of course, managing each one of these departments is actually a complex challenge involving the management of many, many different sub-departments. For example, my money, my incomes, and my outcomes, my savings, my plans for the future, or my home includes repair and maintenance and furnishing and decorating and heating and lighting and security and so on and so on. And so there's a huge management problem there in terms of managing this business and huge issues about prioritization, resource allocation, every single issue that any, any business faces. And to actually manage this uh, business and to manage each department, we have to do many things, such as planning, organizing, going to market, paying, implementing plans, administering, managing supplier relations. A pretty big business, this, managing a human life. So to help us achieve our desired outcomes, we look for tools and sources of supply. And this involves us going to market, which involves us searching for, evaluating, and integrating different sources of supply into our lives. And to achieve our desired outcomes, we invest resources, resources such as my time, my energy, my money, my attention, my information, and so on. So naturally, we seek a return on our investment, our own ROI, our own KPIs. So the first perspective is seller-centric. It sees everything, goals, purposes, processes, metrics, in terms of the seller, and it assumes that the seller is the active one in the process, in the relationship. The second perspective is buyer-centric. It sees the buyer as equally as active, if not more active than the seller, pursuing his own independent goals, using his own processes, and measuring success in terms of his own goals and assets. And to achieve his goals and assets, to achieve his goals and to achieve his KPIs, he has to make and implement better decisions. That's, what value com that's where value comes from for this individual, for this business, making and implementing better decisions. Now, if we said that consumer value is defined by the ability to make and implement 
a better decision. How well is your organisation aligned to what real value looks like from the consumer's point of view? We're probably thinking still that the consumer wants a product or a service. A product or a service is just one part, one tiny part of making and implementing a better decision. So this is where personal information management services come in, and they do two main things. First thing they do is to help individuals make better decisions. Now, helping people make better decisions might sound like a not much of a big deal. Fact is, under our current system, the cost of making a better decision is often so high that it's better not to bother. It's better to make a bad decision rather than to bother trying to make a better decision. Take just one example. As a result of the credit crunch, um, nearly three quarters of the all mortgage, all mortgage products in the UK have been withdrawn from the market. So that leaves only 16,000 mortgages on the UK market at the moment. So if the buyer invested six minutes in trying to access, internalise, and understand the details of each one of these uh, mortgages, that's 16,000 mortgages, that have taken 96,000 minutes, 16,000 hours, or 40 weeks' work out of a 40-hour week. So nearly a year's worth of work to make a good decision about just one product. Now, it may be that you could make a pretty good decision in a week rather than 40 weeks, but that decision-making cost is still much too high because it's replicated across virtually every market you can think of. In fact, according to recent estimates, the current consumer in a Western industrial society has a choice between approximately 10 billion different products. That's 33 million uh, times more than the average rainforest dweller. But now we're beginning to see the beginnings of a revolution in the costs of, per of uh, personal decision making. Okay, we've all heard of Google. Uh, while the costs of producing and distributing information have plummeted over the last century, the cost of consuming information has remained virtually exactly the same. It still takes you the same amount of time to read an article today as it did 100 years ago, or to listen to a radio broadcast. So the more information there is out there, the more time you have to spend trawling through it to find the nuggets of information that are particularly relevant to you. Google strips away 99.9% .9 of that unnecessary work by allowing you to specify in advance which information you want to pay attention to. Meanwhile, a host of product and price comparison sites have emerged over the last five years or so. Compared to the service they could provide, they're still pretty much at the Model T stage of development. But they're based on a very important principle. If I, as a consumer, invest, say, £50 worth of time, money and effort researching the market for a product, say, digital camera, then that effectively adds £50 to the price of that product for me. But if the results of this research are captured and then reused by a thousand other buyers, then the cost per user falls from £50 to 5p. It eliminates a huge amount of rework. Every single day, millions of consumers are reworking decisions today that do not need to be reworked. They're reinventing the wheel, and we can find ways now of getting past that roadblock. It's a massive opportunity in terms of productivity. But sometimes when we do research, it, the research actually raises more questions than the answers. We want advice. And it just so happens that the cost of tapping into helpful, trustworthy advice is also plummeting. Um, one new development on this front, obviously, is peer-to-peer -peer information sharing communities. Uh, countless such communities out there. I've just picked one, Pixalo, which is, uh, uh, promises to be your complete photography re uh, resource. My son spends thousands of pounds on photographic equipment each year. Every single one of these purchases has been based not on the advertising and promotional materials produced by uh, ph photography uh, manufacturers, but on the advice his enthusiast peers have given him via this particular service. He is going to the source of better quality information. 
And some of these services are now mass market propositions. Last month, for example, Money Saving Expert had 6.6 .6 million unique uh, visitors in the UK. And this site carries no advertising because it's committed to impartial advice to help people make better decisions from their point of view rather than from the marketer's point of view. So if you track brand buzz on the internet nowadays, you'll find that in category after category, the biggest source of discussion about brands in the UK now happens on moneysavingexpert.com, uh, and that is people seeking and offering help in making better decisions in an advertising-free environment. But there's a limit to how far peer-to-peer -peer information services can go. What most of us really want is truly expert, well-researched answers that are bespoke to our personal circumstances. The exact question we asked. So in the past, answering such questions was incredibly time-consuming and costly. But in a few minutes, you'll hear from Alex, Alex Cheetle at 10. He's found a way of turning people's ignorance, uh, their questions, into an increasingly valuable knowledge resource that people can use to make better and better decisions at ever lower cost. Problem-solving communities, the concept that Alex will talk about, represents one more pillar supporting this personal decision-making revolution. So why go on about all these things at a conference about Lean? Well, I think they have three implications. First of all, the first implication is that if a company or its marketers enter the room with an agenda of push, they're already writing themselves out of this process that I'm describing. Push and persuasion don't create value for the customer. They destroy value, and they create waste instead. Waste for both sides, a huge amount of waste. The second implication is that it creates a demand, if you like, for lean information. How to get exactly the right information, no more, no less, exactly the right amount of information, to exactly the right person, in exactly the right form, at exactly the right time. How to do that? That's the core operational challenge of personal information management services. Now, the third thing to note is that uh, in making and implementing decisions, and this is crucial, in the process of making decisions, we generate huge amounts of new information. Information about the nature, shape, size, and location of demand. So, in the process of researching and making decisions, individuals do all sorts of things. They ask questions about what's possible, what's available, how should, what they should do, how should they do it. They formulate specifications and preferences. They communicate these expressions of interest to potential suppliers, which in turn triggers all sorts of exchanges and interactions and actions, which generate even more information. And looking back, they may express frustration that they couldn't find what they really wanted, which if we could capture, might drive new product development. Or they might go on to manage a relationship with their suppliers updating uh, information about their relationships about themselves. For example, I've now moved to dress, which is a huge pain in the neck for most suppliers because the information they have is always out of date. So these are all bottom-up flows of information which before were completely lost, they just evaporated. But now we are in a position to capture them. And they all originate with buyers and they can now increasingly be passed on to sellers. And what they're generating is information about demand, the nature, shape, scale, timing, location, not after the decision has been made and somebody walks into a shop to buy something, but actually when it, ha when it really matters, which is during the decision-making process, when it really matters, when value can be added. So this journey from the customer as a stranger to the customer as a partner started some time ago with initiatives such as Tesco's Club Card, which for the first time invited customers to become partners in the process of information gathering and management. Uh, by signing up to the scheme and giving Tesco permission to collect data about their shopping baskets and connect data to their names and addresses and so on. And this scheme has been incredibly successful. It helps Tesco to align virtually everything it does, product ranging, pricing, promotions, store opening times, communications, etc., to what its customers actually do rather than what it wants them to do 
or what it thinks they're doing. But Clubcart is just a very, very small beginning. There are many ways to help uh, people, consumers, say, here I am, this is what I want. So take Google again. Its entire service is driven by bottom-up flows of information from consumers who tap into their search term, actually, right now, this is what I'm interested in, this is what I want, this is my demand. Uh, we can see how valuable this information is. In less than 10 years, on the back of this information, consumers volunteer it to Google. Google has become the biggest media company in the world by market capitalization. Its revenues are, uh, are growing rapidly, as you can see. Problem-solving communities, such as those being pioneered by 10, are opening up a different possibility. By listening to the questions specific communities of people ask, and how these questions change over time, it's becoming possible for problem-solving communities to keep a handle on the value of what value looks like from the customer's point of view in real time. There are other services waiting in the wings. Uh, I'm currently involved in setting up this company called Mydex, which is establishing a mechanism by which individuals can share the information they want to share with the organizations they want to share it with uh, in a structured, auditable, secure, encrypted, machine-readable, scalable manner. In other words, we're talking about the evolution of a new mass-scale infrastructure for the bottom-up flows of information, information with the potential to, strange, to turn strangers into partners and for consumers to move beyond mere choice to voice. Perhaps this information has the ability to become the starting point for lean operations. Uh, the ability to deliver exactly the right mix of product, service, information and advice to the right person at the right time, at the right place. But so far, we've looked only at decision making. What about decision implementation? This slide shows some of the main steps involved in buying a house. It's based on a planning service uh, provided by moveme.com, which helps home buyers plan everything they need to buy a house and when. It's a highly simplified version. It ignores any considerations relating to kids or pets. Uh, it ignores the parallel process of selling your house. It ignores anything you may want to do to redecorate re or alter your house, along with all the detailed pr process steps involved in, say, finding uh, uh, the right mortgage or solicitor or removal company or dealing with these suppliers in the process of the actual move. So the real process of moving house is about sort of 50 times more complicated than that. So what solution orchestrators do, like MoveMe, is to understand the consumer's side of key processes. And note from the consumer side, the, demand, the value lies in moving house. It's not the mortgage or the solicitor or the removal van. They're just ingredients of the real objective, which is to move house. So they help consumers understand these, these key processes, and they use this understanding to help the consumer manage the process better and doing all the planning, administrating, coordinating, arranging, delivering, and connecting of all the different separate suppliers who are all focused on only their one little bit of this total value proposition. So that's great as far as it goes, but solution orchestration needn't be just a private personal planning tool. It can also be a communication and organizational tool, a tool which the consumer uses to connect with suppliers, uh, to alert them to planned activities, and to organize and coordinate to make sure that the right things happen at the right time, at the right place. So solution orchestration is another way that personal information management services can turn strangers into partners, give voice to demand, and thereby make it possible for information about the nature, scale, timing, location of demand, both granular personalized information and aggregated anonymized information to be passed on to suppliers so that suppliers can use it to align not just their internal operations, but everything they do to real demand as expressed at the horse's mouth by the source of demand, not guesswork. By the way, moving house is just an example. We've identified over 70 significant life events whose core processes can be mapped where each such map can be used as a planning and communication tool for both the individual and his suppliers. Uh, 
And that's not counting ongoing life management processes such as manage personal finances, repair and maintain home, or manage chronic, chronic disease, or whatever it happens to be. So if we put these developments together, both better decision-making and better implementation of decisions, we can see it addresses all the key elements of the customer interface. New product development, marketing, sales, customer service, customer relationship management, and it does so in a way that it's defined by value as defined by the customer. So it's aligning value as defined by the customer. So let me finish with one thought. Earlier on, I suggested that batch production and push marketing march hand in hand as part of the same integrated system. This means that it's very difficult to transform just one part of the system while leaving the other parts of the system intact and unchanged. If we try to realign marketing away from push to become a genuine customer service, then it's quickly sucked back into serving the needs of batch. And we can only go so far in leaning organizations' operations without reaching beyond the boundaries of the organization to the interface to the customer. And if the customer doesn't change, we can't change. So we need to change the system, not just the parts of the system. Now, perhaps, a new, a huge new win-win opportunity is emerging, one which helps address both the making side of the economic equation and the matching and connecting side of the economic equation, which helps organizations turn marketing, sales, customer service, relationship management, and everything into services that genuinely do add value to consumers because they are acting on the voice of the consumer. If batch production and push marketing march hand in hand to create a complete economic system, then perhaps lean operations will march hand in hand with new consumer empowering services, services that give consumers a voice and turn them into partners. If so, this would not only be an organizational transformation, it would be, it would be a system transformation at the same time. An economic system that was truly customer focused for the first time. Thank you.